Right at our command post is dog, cold. Because of the continuous explosions, the thin wall has crumbled. The icy east wind whistles through the cracks and flapping window frames. As a rule, we are in full uniform, girded with cartridge belts, sitting at the ready at a rickety table, with the collars of our overcoats high and our hands deep in our pockets. The topic of all conversations is the same, how long can we hold out, and can we even be unblocked? Opinions are sharply divided. While we weigh the pros and cons, hordes of insects are crawling all over us. Our whole body itches. Many days, whole weeks, we don't undress, lice overpower us. The first cases of hives were reported in late fall, but at this point it doesn't matter anymore. The soldiers don't even pay attention to insect bites. We are constantly hungry. For a long time, only a piece of bread and hot water twice a day will make anybody go on strike. Horse meat has become a rare jewel. Even horses that had fallen weeks ago were eaten. The wind exposed a horse's head or thigh from under the snow, and they were immediately extracted. The frozen meat was immediately separated from the bones and put into a cauldron, and the skeleton was covered with new snow. In the first days, I was still able to help my 500 soldiers at the expense of supplies brought from the sanatorium, but they quickly ran out and hunger makes itself felt every day. That being said, our soldiers are still somewhat better off, as they receive much more food than the others. This is because, although rations for 500 men are delivered to us from evening to evening, the number of soldiers has been halved during this time, and at times only one-tenth have remained at all. And not only because some of the soldiers have been killed and others wounded, and are hiding in some unknown cellars. No, the number of defectors increased. German soldiers voluntarily surrendering to the enemy. This is new, and it is so hard to believe that I cannot even realize at first. But the reports confirm this fact. Apparently, the possibility of staying alive after such a battle and then returning home is stronger than hunger and the inevitability of death, although the words honor and heroism are associated with it. However, it cannot be said that the soldiers were greatly influenced by the voice of the Moscow radio, which relentlessly repeats. Every seven seconds, one German soldier dies in Russia, nor can it be said that they were swayed by the mere reminder Stalingrad is a mass grave. No, the fact is that since Christmas something new has sounded in the cauldron. These are the voices of the Germans themselves addressing us across the front line, the voices of officers who have been missing for months now, the voices of German writers and even one member of the Reichstag. His name is Ulbricht. I don't know the name. And how could I know it? I used to be so proud of standing outside politics. But what he tells us, what he repeats night after night, finds its listeners. His words, in any case, are listened to much more than the records that the Russians have been playing for the last few weeks. This is the German voice. This is the real German language, not a translation from Russian which is dismissed as enemy propaganda. No, this German on the other side is being listened to, and he has a convincing argument when he talks about the hopelessness of our situation and how each of us will still be needed after the war. What he says about the war monopolies making millions from the war is completely new to us, and here in Stalingrad we cannot verify it. Russians hate only Hitler's state and its bosses, not the German people. It seems that this is indeed true, otherwise the German officers who spoke afterwards would not have asserted it either. Our invisible interlocutor is able to outline in few words the misfortunes of each of us individually and to show them in the whole interrelation of events, thus confronting the frontline soldier with the decision either to continue resistance pointlessly or to capitulate. And if the officers don't want him to do so, then surrender at his own risk. Your fate is in your own hands. There are moments when I realize that groups of German soldiers are beginning to act on their own and turn their backs on an army betrayed by higher command for they feel they are obliged to do so for the sake of their wives and children. In my thoughts, too, I have loved long ago betrayed my military duty, and only my oath and officer's epaulets keep me from surrendering with my battle group, and the fact that I don't know exactly what really awaits us on the other side. Anyway, one night only fifty men remain of my entire battle group. During the night, the phone reports that the army is scraping up everything it has, combing cellars and infirmaries, detaining those who have broken away from the unit. By morning, the former strength is restored, and the day ends as it did yesterday. Russian attacks demand new casualties from us. The enemy's artillery keeps the area under fire, preventing us from taking a single step. Even to go to a waste place is as dangerous as to go on a reconnaissance battle.
Death triumphs over us with ease. Death comes to us in any guise and in any form. Then it is a whistling shell of an infantry gun, then a snarling shell of a large caliber, then a howling mine, then an armored self-propelled vehicle, then a hungry ration, then a greedy rash or frost well below zero. Death is like that fabulous drummer that the people run after. The battle area area is strewn with corpses, green and frozen to the ground, in overcoats covered with brown bloodstains. They lie in the snow in the positions in which death has caught up with them. Some, in the trenches, leaning on the improvised bumper, patrols and scout groups, on the neutral strip pressed to the ground food carriers, on the edge of a beaten path, with punctured thermoses on their backs, and next to it, the liaison zone clasping a written order in his stiffened hand. It's no longer up to funeral commands. All those who can still hold a rifle in their hand are sent to the front line and the rest are needed to deliver orders. Our right neighbor has the same worries. Major Willig, who formerly held a position in Marinovka, at the first personal meeting tells me how things are at his place. Under the former GPU prison, in a cellar securely protected from bombing and shells, the remnants of the headquarters of the corps of Seidlitz and Schlemer, the divisions of Daniels and Angen, this section of the frontier at Tsaritsa is also stubbornly defended by fragments of former front and rear units, so variegated that even the officers themselves do not know their exact composition. Ammunition is running low. There are no more heavy weapons. But while still in these half-frostbitten, starved, stripped remnants of regiments that no longer exist, the will to resist still occasionally flares up. And in the midst of all this tragedy, a group of generals who do not know what to do, unable to make any decision, and rushing from one extreme to another. I can't wait for the end. But which one? The younger staff officers are in favor of a breakthrough. They are discussing the way out of the encirclement, devouring the food supplies still available to conserve strength, and gathering the necessary armaments. These adventurous sentiments are fueled by leftover liquor. Older officers, who physically cannot bear such an operation, indulge in dreams of various ways out. What next? What to do now when the headquarters are falling apart, when there is no strict leadership on the part of the army command, and there is only one answer? We will not capitulate, fight to the last bullet, in the well-heated cellars, by the light of numerous candles, they discuss point by point what to do with the wounded, what to say to the soldiers, what to do in case of a Russian attack. And here rises the corpse commander and truly classically utters the crown of his wisdom. If tomorrow the Russians will go on the attack, the battle will be started and then finished. Uh, the commanders interject. Is this really said by a man who all his life wore the uniform of an officer, a general with a famous soldier's name, who gave orders that decided the fate of tens of thousands of people? Each regimental commander now acts independently. Many of them are no longer willing to throw their men into battle and take on the heavy burden of responsibility for their senseless deaths. Soldiers are quartered in cellars, distribute among them the last remnants of fire. It is necessary to prepare their necessary things for the inevitable captivity. The Russians won't kill everyone, the officers think, and those who survive and someday return to Germany will still be useful to her. Such officers say to their soldiers, I will not leave you. I reject suicide or breakout. Your fate is also mine. Keep order and discipline. And after that they decide who will stay with the wounded to the end. But the commanders of the units ahead, at the Serena, learn about this only from good friends, and therefore continue to stand their ground, defend and fight and only one of the lost-headed generals finally finds the courage to act. It's General Daniels. He wants to surrender. He draws up a written document to be handed over to the enemy. He wants to surrender with the remnants of his soldiers, and proposes that until the final liquidation of the cauldron, they should remain in cellars that give warmth and protection, near field kitchens that guarantee at least a modicum of life. He wants nothing for pathetic phrase. He wants nothing for himself, personally. What greatness of soul! The document is ready. But who will deliver it to the Russians? Surrender is forbidden. Of course, the army commander must not know about it. After all, he personally, together with his staff, will be in a foolish position. If his shattered army will lay down arms. After all, it is a matter of life and death. But who will go there? To the Russians? Daniels himself? Oh no, that's impossible. A German general in person. Colonel Steidel is ill and he would be next in rank as regimental commander of Daniel's division. Finally, a major agrees to go to the Russians, with him another young officer and an interpreter, a Sonderfuhrer. 
but with them must go and an older officer in rank. In the corridor of the basement, Daniels runs into the regimental commander Boyer. Boyer, are you in favor of stopping the fight? Yes. Then go to the Russians now. Boyer agrees. He is really in favor of stopping this senseless self-suffocation, and being a man of consistency, considers it unacceptable for him to shirk this task. In a car with a white sheet fixed on a stick, they drive out to the Seritzer, endlessly waiting for a long time at one control until this section of the front will not stop firing. After all, the army command gave the order to shoot at the parliamentarians, and it was ordered by the command of the very army, which until now had obeyed any order from above and which had very few officers left in its headquarters. Even the Nachtstaba himself told the commander a few days ago that he, the Nachtstaba, would be much more useful to the army outside the cauldron, and therefore should fly away at the first opportunity. So at last a lull is established at the front. Four German officers climb out of the car and down the steep slope. The colonel is holding a white flag. He, the commander of what was once one of the most glorious regiments of the German army, the D.H. Meisters, wishes to surrender to the mercy of the victor. Many hours have passed, dusk has long since descended. At last the parliamentarians return, with them two Russian officers. All six are wounded. By German machine gun fire, the Germans fired in spite of the white flag, in spite of the signals, in spite of the shouts of the German officers, parliamentarians. Cease fire. But all was in vain, because in the meantime a breakthrough had occurred. The army command had somehow learned of the intention to surrender. Any unauthorized negotiations with the Russians are forbidden, in the voice of the chief of staff of the army sounded a clear threat. Daniels was afraid of his own courage. Paulus will try to arrest me and put to the wall. Now he is probably already radiating to the Fuhrer's headquarters. Hitler will subject my family to reprisals. My poor wife and children. I haven't even seen the youngest one yet. He wails with tears in his eyes, completely losing his temper. What am I to do now? The Russian officers are informed that due to changes in the chain of command, it is necessary to inform several higher officers in order not to jeopardize the whole affair. Before Daniels goes to bed, he asks Boyer to post a guard for the night. He is afraid lest he be arrested by army headquarters. The next day the Russians do not attack, and Daniels is not arrested. The meetings continue. Frontline commanders arrive asking for instructions, again contacted by telephone with the army headquarters. Third of mouth reports that the chief of staff, as if said, in view of the fact that many officers ours, as ordered, committed suicide, and others see it as a last resort, the surrender is out of the question. There is no possibility for it, for it is necessary to fight to the last cartridge. So in this devil's cauldron there was room for farce, with pathetic and meaningless phrases. Look around noon, a ghost-like army commander suddenly appears in the building. He's looking for the generals. Negotiations on surrender are unacceptable. This is the theme of his speech. But he does not indicate a way out and he does not want to command the army either. Besides, command is only illusion. The ring is getting narrower and narrower. Tens of thousands of wounded are lying without any care in ruins. Cellars, dugouts or perish from the merciless frost. But the army command shows no compassion for them, is not horrified by this nightmare surrounding him, and in the midst of the apocalyptic bacchanalia of annihilation remains cold, heartless and inexorable. After all of Willig's account, I am becoming quite fearful that a crisis is brewing on our right. Almost daily changes in command. One commands Schlemmer, the other Daniels, one is wounded, and the other is not in the mood. Increase the possibility of all sorts of surprises that could come at us from the right flank. On the way back oriented in the situation at the commander of the anti-aircraft battery, and ordered him to be especially attentive to our right flank. January 28. For variety again tank alarm. Jumping out with Tony on the big street. From the Saritza River, one after the other climb up two T-34s, one after the other about 200 meters from a multi-story building. If they continue on the same course, they will inevitably come right at our howitzer. With its four shells, it could hit both of them. I'm rushing to the right. The howitzer is still standing there, but lonely, abandoned, no gunners. I call out. Tony runs into a nearby dugout. They're nowhere to be found. What a surprise. They must have defected to the Russians. In front of us is already rumbling. The first tank is already some 30 meters away. The second one is not lagging behind it. They're both firing from the get-go. 
I see two soldiers falling who ran out of the house opposite. The tanks are approaching the street at a rapid pace without a single shot from our side. A momentary stop, a turn, and here is a tank rushing in the direction of the railroad embankment to the overpass. Now it's the turn of the second one. He has obviously noticed us because he fires several machine gun bursts at us. We can't mess with him and have to get away. At the worst, we will be left with only one means of defense, a white handkerchief and still surviving hands raised up in surrender. Isn't the defecting gunners the right thing to do? January 29. Comes what I had been waiting for two days. The 14th Panzer Corps capitulates. As soon as I learn about it, I rush to the railroad embankment, followed by Glock, Tony and Beisman, followed by the commander of the anti-aircraft battery. The area on the other side of the overpass, hitherto deserted, is now lively. From all the holes and cellars, from windows and doors appear soldiers. They rise from behind every snowbank. The groups form, large and small crowds. They carry carbines, pistols, machine guns to one place. They pack their belongings. Some soldiers clap each other on the shoulder or shake hands, and the victors walk between them in their fur coats and cotton coats with automatic rifles hanging as lant on their chests or taken at the ready. Columns are formed. Here all of them are four in a row. Infantry in the world is mixed up here. Infantry, tankers, aviation, different ranks, overcoats and mascalots, soldiers old and young, high and low, straightened and bent, without things and with satchels on their backs, helmets, caps and caps. Suddenly six shots rang out from afar. There, in the lineup of the companies, a number of soldiers fall. What a mad dazzle. The Germans are shooting at the Germans, only because there is an order to open fire on the defectors. I send Glock to stop this killing immediately. Now I am deliberately acting contrary to the order, hindering its execution, and a minute later I am giving orders dictated by the spirit of the same order. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. But perhaps I'm not the only one. Defeat and surrender have not yet been taught to us in the Wehrmacht, neither on the plazers nor in sandboxes. Now we have a flank hanging in the air on our right. We need to set up a cut-off position. From a military point of view it's clear, but with our forces it's impossible. We must take one squad from the anti-aircraft battery and turn at the embankment with the front to the west. I have no other forces at my disposal. Anything beyond that is up to the army command. Let it act on its own now, one way or the other. We already know in advance the decision that will be made up there, to fight on, to hold a new position at all costs. Major Dobakau, battalion commander of the Roskwi Regiment, has received orders from the Army Command to take a new front line along the railroad embankment. There are defending only a few sick and a few more soldiers who were not taken to the infirmary for lack of space. The rest the Major will have to search the cellars himself. We are no better off with the replenishment needed to hold our positions. We are also being told to utilize some uncommitted manpower reserves. And around noon I go down with Lens to the first basement behind us. The elongated building is about 50 meters behind us. A sepulchral silence reigns down here and yet there must be people here. I swing open the door. A bright room. The snow outside through the dirty window panes casts a glare on a few dozen men sleeping on the floor in their grey sweaters or unbuttoned uniforms. Straw, unplanked boards, and doors pulled off their hinges serve as their beds. I recognize a lieutenant of about thirty years of age among them by his epaulet, which is torn off and held on only by one button. Unwashed, blonde strands falling over his face, his hair in wild disorder over his frostbitten ears. He raises himself on an elbow. What are you doing here? I ask. And he doesn't answer anything at first. His half-open, staring eyes stare dumbly at me. Instead of answering, he turns his right shoulder toward me. A stump in place of an arm, the sleeve of his sweater empty. He's twenty years old, has been down here for four days now, and has only eaten once since. It was on the last night. Two soldiers found the dropped food and dragged it down here. The sausage, bread and canned goods were immediately divided up and immediately eaten. Not a single person cares for them. All the soldiers here are wounded. In the next room it is absolutely the same. I am answered with mad laughter, restrained rage, bursts of anger or no answer at all, depending on my condition and temperament. There is no one here who doesn't have at least one wound that would normally send him to the hospital. And that one over there. I point to one soldier lying motionless. May died yesterday. The speaker looks at me as if it goes without saying lying on the corpses of his comrades. So here it is, our reserve regiment, here it is. 
the inexhaustible reserve of the Sixth Army. These soldiers, too, once marched with us in the ranks, fought with us. Now they have neither health nor dignity left, and I must beckon them to the front line with the promise of hot soup, only so that they may find their end sooner, and we ourselves may postpone, perhaps for a day, our imminent doom. In the afternoon I send a report of the lack of men and ask for reinforcements. It is urgently needed, as the new front line is still not fixed. Perhaps a major Russian attack from the west will follow early in the morning, and this flank attack will overturn us. That's why I'm sending out a six-man reconnaissance team. I want to know what's happening on my right. But before I know it, harsh reality foils all intentions and combinations. Suddenly, six T-34s appear in front of the neighbouring building, where Woolsey's command post was located until recently. Two take up position on the corners and two drive into the courtyard. The infantry sitting on them jumps off, and the tank guns are already pounding the ruined wall so that shells burst on the other side of it. One episode further tightens the natural course of events. At the entrance to the courtyard appears Woos with his staff of five men. Each holds a carbine, each with a single clip. Thirty shots are fired quickly, with uncovered head and as calmly as he appeared. The general disappears again into the building. The no one can even lift a finger to save the commander of our southern front, as the Russian tanks do not allow to move. Finally, the firing in the immediate vicinity subsides. Two Russians follow walls and after a few minutes bring him outside. He is shown a place on the armour of the tank, put on his luggage. Then the whole tank column goes westward. From this we made a conclusion for ourselves. It is too conspicuous to set up a CP right on the street. So we move our CP. We are located in a huge building with two wings. This is the so-called hunting park. Here, though with a great delay, I receive a report from the Centre Reconnaissance Group. Only two, two out of six, have returned, but both of them shining with joy and carrying bread in their hands and under their arms. Twenty kilograms, I quickly estimate. One report. The Russians captured us near the A prison, but they did nothing to us. On the contrary, the men turned out to be good guys. They took us to the field kitchen and fed us to our heart's content. Four ladles each. Pea soup is the best. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Major, it's a poem. Then they said to us, I too can come back. We drew loss, me and Wilhelm. But to tell you the truth, I wish I'd stayed there. We were about to leave. And then an elderly Russian with glasses came up to us and said in German, well, it's only called that in German, but we understood him. Come on, everyone, there's enough food. And he gave us bread for the road. And we smoked two. Wilhelm smoked three, and I smoked two cigarettes. Both could say nothing about the Russians' preparations for the attack. Obviously, they didn't notice anything. And that they brought bread? That's great. Anyway, we won't have long to wait for the consequences. During the night, everything shakes with a rumble. Around midnight, Russian tanks burst into our neighbourhood, continuously rumbling on the sidewalk tracks. Not a single anti-tank gun, not a single German gun does not interfere with the T-34s walking along. Planted on the armour machine gunners jump off, fight in our location and knock our soldiers out of individual houses. In a few minutes destroy command posts and entire headquarters, which just a short time ago felt completely safe. The firing is going on at Hunting Park, too. Among the ruins appear the figures of Russian soldiers in white camouflage coats. They sneak from wall to wall and try to seize the exits from the cellars with lightning-fast throws. But we desperately resist. We are afraid of captivity, or, to be more precise, the moment when we will have to raise our hands. It seems incomprehensible to me, and I'm sure my family, even my wife, wouldn't understand it either, but it is. It can only be understood by those who fought in Stalingrad from the very beginning, who saw how houses and factories were still standing here, and the streets were almost intact. What can we expect from the Russians after what we have done here? Their exasperation will be enormous, doubly enormous, because the destruction of the city has continued during the last weeks, when our fate was already decided. This exasperation will also be enormous because it is the last few days that have brought them great losses. We will raise our hands, and at first they will think we want to throw grenades again. How will they feel about us? At the 14th Tank Corps, everything went well, we saw that. But whether it will always be like that and what will happen to us afterwards, nobody knows. All this is covered by the darkness of the unknown. That's why I can't make up my mind. That's why I keep postponing this step. The result of the night fighting is a lot of casualties. 
The dead lie on the stairs. The wounded are carried to the sanitary cellars. Even in front, where the tanks have just passed and where there was no battle at all, new gaps are also gaping. But there are no dead or wounded here. There are no soldiers here at all. They defected to the Russians under cover of darkness, and not without the influence of our yesterday's reconnaissance team and Russian bread. This night has shown that the defence must be organised more clearly. Therefore, Hunting Park we divided into two zones. Major Linden takes command of the right wing, I.I., the left. Immediately in the first morning hours, we begin to build new barricades and equip embrasures on the upper floors. Today is January 30th, a holiday of National Socialist Germany. Ten years since Hitler came to power. Enough reason to shower honours on the zealous followers of the Nazi regime? Paulus produced in the rank of General Field Marshal, not lagging behind in this matter, and the command of the army. In these days, when the water already truly comes to the very throat, it finds nothing more important than to engage in ranks, awards and the like. Entire boxes of orders are being emptied. Rain knights and German crosses poured on deserving and undeserving. Officers of the army staff and other staffs who have fought only a few months receive high honours, to which all instructions are not entitled. They are promoted to ranks and positions that, God knows, are unacceptable even in this situation. Generals are born into the light of God, having such a long service, which before would not have been enough, perhaps, for the rank of captain. But only they can't give vacations to the homeland, and even those who are not entitled to them would get them. We will distribute awards and ranks with both hands. Anyway, the lucky ones are of little use. And meanwhile, there are still such officers who consider these awards and promotions deserved, and are proud of them. Around noon on the radio broadcast Goering's speech. In a neighbouring cellar where there was still a serviceable receiver, the soldiers, who were free from service, were listening to the loudspeaker. Some still haven't given up hope. They still believe Hitler's promise to rescue us. You can rely on me like a rock, was then broadcast to all soldiers and officers. The Führerjibbles cling to this promise. The Führer will not leave us sitting here. Today Goering will tell us everything as it is and someone who has already mentally said goodbye to life also lights up a faint hope. A voice from the loudspeaker broadcasts about the people's community and the people's army. All these are catchphrases that we have heard thousands of times. They are quite well known to us. Hitler is called the greatest German. Then Goering declares, The enemy is tough, but the German soldier has become even tougher. Hmm, come here. I want to shout in the face of this Fraser. Come and see for yourself the soldiers who have become even harder. Here they lie in cellars and snow pits, barely able to move. Horse meat soup, and that once a day. That's all their strength. A goring won't stop. Above all gigantic battles stands like a huge monument Stalingrad. The battle for Stalingrad. This is the greatest heroic battle of all that our history has ever known. He means us. High words, but they make us neither hot nor cold. They are highly suspicious. That's what a priest says at an open grave. Then, too, the dead man is made into a heroic god. But it doesn't make him feel any better. Hearing rants about how in battle the generals and soldiers stood together shoulder to shoulder spreads about the heroic battle of the Nibelungs. They, too, stood to the last. OK, the verdict has been pronounced. We are definitively written off. Goes through my head. Written off once and for all. We have been sacrificed. Despite Hitler's promise, even today, they're already making money off our deaths. Here, see how these heroes stand, avenge them, fight with the same fierceness. Goering lays it out unabashedly. Let everyone who feels weakness in himself remember the soldiers of Stalingrad. Turn off the box, shouts Fricky. Shut it up. Or maybe you want to listen to a eulogy to yourself. It's good for the fat man to talk. He's sitting in Berlin and we're dying here. No. Turn it off. Turn it off. No, naughty. We want to listen. Someone yells. A terrible noise rises. Then at last there is silence again. Now it's Leonidas and his three hundred Spartans. Goering spares no words in describing our heroism and deftly makes the transition to our fake. The time will come and they will sigh. O oh, traveller, when you come to Germany, tell about us, about those who fell in Stalingrad, as the law commanded us. Let me go, let me go. I can't listen to this. Shouts an elderly sergeant. He pushes his neighbour away, makes his way to the receiver. A short blow with the butt of his rifle. Everything happens lightning fast, 
No one has time to hold him back, and the receiver is nothing but rubble. Coils and lamps are lying on the floor, six, seven boots crushing them into small pieces. The voice is silent. I am silent. I think it is the right thing to do. Mr. Major, the Russians near us are already capitulating. That's Beisman's voice. He's not mistaken. Alarm. I shout loudly. Two liaisons chase everyone out of the cellar. I run up the stairs. Tony and Glock follow me. Upstairs, in front of the building, the tanks are again firing, fanning the area. Sheaves of shells are flying along the street. All the exits are under fire. Ricochets whistle overhead. But I need to know what's happening here. The quickest way to get into position is to run through the big gate. A jump and I'm already outside, running as hard as I can along the wall, with bursts to my right and left, my helmet pulling down over my eyes. Another ten meters, two more. Now hurry around the corner, again in the gate and tee. A deafening blow on the back of my head rolls me off my feet. I fall into the snow. A broad-shouldered Red Army soldier bent over me. I look into the muzzle of the machine gun. Hmm, come on. He shouts and with a gesture of an order points to the right. I turn my head. There, one by one, German soldiers with raised arms and no weapons are coming out of the cellar. Thirty paces further on, a column of four rows is already forming. Lyndon also stands in line. I stand next to him. We shake hands. Then he briefly tells me how it all happened. The T-34s came out of the blue. The posts at the entrance were powerless. Hand grenades flew into the cellar. The result was terrible. To avoid further bloodshed, says Lyndon, I immediately capitulated. Incredibly slow stretches our column of prisoners of war through the endless ruins of the city on the great river, silent and faceless. Hunger and blood, hell and cruelty, madness and betrayal are behind us. We don't know what lies ahead. We wander devastated, infinitely tired, exhausted, finished. We can't hear a word, our heads are drooping, we can't think, and why should we... Everything is in vain, death is meaningless, life is meaningless. I wish I had died then in shop, no. Four? Are you Oberlutent? A Russian non-commissioned officer appears in front of me, shaking me by my overcoat. What does he want from me? Oberlutent. He repeats his question. No, Major. Ah, Major, you're a Major, Major. And I already feel him grabbing me. Dragging me, pushing me, shouting something fiercely at me, swinging at me, threatening me with his raised fist. But then I hear another loud voice. Someone is holding his arm, pushing him aside. A young lieutenant claps me on the shoulder. Mr. Major, I'm sorry. Our men are gut, but here, in Stalingrad, there are a lot of dead, a lot of blood, you understand. Don't take offence, follow. The lieutenant stops the whole column and leads me forward. With a sigh of relief, I follow him. I hear him talking to the head of the column. Then he turns to me. Hey, the comrade will look after you. Nothing will happen to you, and then the war will be kaput. Hitler's kaput. You'll come home. And he shakes my hand. The basement of the department store is full of soldiers. They sit along the walls, pressed closely together, as if fused together, leaving a gap for the door. It's the same picture on the other wall. Meanwhile, in the semi-darkness, there is intense staff activity. Scribes and radio operators with documents in their hands are running, tripping over outstretched legs and things lying around, knocking on doors, opening and closing them, running back, colliding with newly aged. The brain of the dying body is still functioning. The news of the final collapse of the southern front of the cauldron causes great confusion. While we, who are defending this section, have already left the city under a convoy of Russian soldiers, the chief of staff of the 6th Army, Lieutenant General Schmidt orders to eliminate the breakthrough. Hastily composed combat groups are thrown forward. Even their names are unknown. They must at any cost to prevent further advance of the Russians through the hunting park. I don't see it all anymore. The true picture of the last hours in the cellar of Field Marshal Paulus was drawn to me by Major Dobako, whom I met three days later in captivity in Krasnomaisk. And Captain Mark Gruff from the anti-tank division told me about the Northern Cauldron. German soldier in Stalingrad, a contradictory phenomenon. On the one hand, he is aware of the hopelessness of his situation, and on the other, fiercely fighting for the last pile of ruins. At eleven o'clock in the morning, he curses the command and the Führer, breaks the radio, not wanting to listen to the speech of Reichsmarschall Goering, and at twelve o'clock, again stretches his arms at the seams when he is driven to death, says Joho, 
and obeys. The last days of the German army in Stalingrad are truly tragic, seeing before themselves a saving island, bread, medicines, rest, and all this in such an achievable proximity, the German soldiers accustomed not thinking to say Jarl, through the cold, through the deprivation of many days and nights, blindly step towards their own death. Soldierly obedience has become part of their flesh and blood. They understand by it unconditional obedience, immediately, without leaving their seats, without thinking. They have long ago lost such soldierly virtues as reasonable courage, nobility, the concept of honour and dignity, respect for life. A soldier no longer has to think. He is obliged only to obey, to be courageous and brave, loyal to the last minute, without asking for what and for what. All those who stand here and fight, they are all only servants of their master, automatons that perform mechanical actions when a coin is dropped into them. Only on the basis of this upbringing has it become at all possible that the resistance still continues, that thousands of soldiers are still needlessly dying at the last minute. This is how the spring that has been wound up for years is unwound. In the room of the Chief of Communications of the Army reigns confusion, around Colonel Van Hooven seated about twenty officers. Here is an elderly major who had been Commandant of Headquarters somewhere. Now he is reading the New Testament with reverence. Beside him a young artillery captain is rummaging through his belongings. He empties his wallet and clipboard, then goes to the iron stove in the middle of the room, throws into it everything that he no longer needs. A soldier's book, letters, photographs and money in the corner by the basement window stand three oberlutenants. They are leaning over a map, which one of them is holding, and talking about the so-called evacuation points. The thing is that the Wehrmacht High Command a week ago sent a radiogram. Those who want to break through will be assisted. The aviation was instructed to regularly fly over certain points between the Volga and the front line and drop food and spotted groups of German soldiers to take on board and transport to the rear. The nearest such designated point was 30 kilometres southwest, near Kotelnikovo, and was called Novi Put. It could have been reached by many. But the army command, afraid to lose the last fighting forces, did this order. Only a few officers of higher headquarters know about it. Now they expect to seize this chance to get out of the cauldron. A variety of proposals are made. One suggests using a captured T-34 tank. Quite fueled, it stands in a neighbouring yard. Another thinks that it is necessary to try to break through the front line at night by cars, blinding the enemy with the light of searchlights. A third is in favour of fleeing on foot. Someone else suggests entrenching in the ruins to wait out the surrender in the underground, and when the big wave of Russians will subside, to break through. All these younger officers are discussing the tenth or twentieth step not realising that they will stumble and fall into the abyss at the very first one. It is impossible to understand why these lieutenants can manage their time so independently and freely. Front officers are ordered, as before, to hold their positions and stay with their soldiers, because any attempt to break through, with or without permission, in groups or clusters, even the very thought of it would have a demoralising effect on the troops. But for themselves, the staffs have a different yardstick. All the uninvited guests and officers who are now in the army headquarters discussing the possibility of getting out, in fact, already summarise the sad conclusion of the chapter Stalingrad. It is useless and transfer to the cauldron on airplanes vacationers, especially officers. They are already enough. In addition, there are many headquarters without troops and they are looking for and find every use. However, some headquarters manage to get out by airplanes. They dragged with them absolutely unthinkable things such as cases of alcoholic beverages. Was it not more important to capture the wounded? Those who are gathered here are completely confused, confounded, and no longer understand anything, for everything that is happening around them is happening against common sense and reason. All that they had hitherto revered and honoured, approved of, taught and inculcated in their soldiers has disappeared. The wheel of history is moving forward. It has run over them. Many of the officers are in favour of ending it. We must save those who are still alive. Germany still needs us is their slogan. They have enough courage for self-sacrifice, they have proved it enough. Every one of them has become a common infantryman here. Everyone has fired a shot, and seldom when anyone has shown personal cowardice. But can now an army commander with a clear conscience still demand that the order to hold out be obeyed? Colonel Van Hooven speaks to the chief of operations of the army staff, asks him whether the field marshal really knows about the state of the last soldiers about the hopeless situation of the wounded, 
He confirms and reiterates that nevertheless we must fight to the last. But what else can benefit the command of the Wehrmacht these last hours worth streams of blood? Murday, exclaimed Marshal Cambron, and put his sabre into its scabbard when, at the Battle of Waterloo, after the last attempt of Napoleon's old guard battalions to regain the position, a concentric attack by the British and Prussians caused the still unshaken carriage to tremble. The officers of the Sixth Army often had that old soldier's swear word tumbling from their lips, and with good reason. But today, January 30, there are no longer strong enough words and curses to express all the indignation at what the order still demanded. Hours have passed, evening has come. The officers sit around the burning candle. There are only four centimetres left in it, and it is the last one. Soon darkness will fall. Colonel Van Hooven has returned from a meeting with the army commander and has brought a pack of cigarettes. Everyone smokes one. The bursts of heavy shells shake the thick walls of the cellar. The young artillery captain nervously taps his hand on the table, shifts his gaze from one face to another. The look is questioning and unsure, as if the captain is looking for support. Then he can't stand it. Mr. Colonel, let me ask you a question. What will you do when the Russians appear? The chief of communications of the army calmly looks at him. The answer sounds clear and precise. No surrender as a prisoner. And to Captain Flinches cannot hide his amazement. He looks at the colonel, at his wicker epaulettes with two gold stars, shakes his head. Mr. Colonel, you can't. We, officers, can't go back to our homeland alone and tell the German people. Your sons were left lying in Stalingrad and we are the only ones who stayed alive who saved themselves when they had already fallen? And yet we can. Van Hooven raises his voice. The percentage of dead officers is the same as soldiers. No one can blame us for that. Not only can we return to Germany, we must. It is we who are called upon to tell the motherland the truth. I went through the First World War. I lived through that horror twice. Now it's enough. It must never happen again. I said, Mr. Colonel, but we all didn't want war. Or maybe you did. No, we all didn't. But when the time of great success came, we were all eager to keep up. Until we ended up in this basement. You have to admit that. The captain's not giving up. He's finally found a senior officer who's answering his questions. That's what mood processing accomplishes. Call it mood management, whatever you want. Propaganda, education, that's what got us this far. But all this is only possible in a state where the Fuhrer's principle reigns supreme. We all have our own common sense, we can talk about it today, so why didn't we do it before? Democracy is what we need. The others listen attentively, but do not enter into the conversation. Just listening. Mm -hmm. How do you envision this? It's already like an interview, but we'll have to have a serious talk about that after the war. Here, in this basement, I can't give you any prescription. Mr. Colonel, do you think they'll listen to our voices after the war? It won't be easy. I admit, but it won't be unsuccessful. I've been thinking about it a lot these last few days, and I see the future in front of me. If it comes to fruition, the terrible sacrifices we have made will not be in vain. The deaths of our comrades here in Stalingrad will then acquire a deep meaning. Reasonable words are sounding. The connection of events is becoming clearer. The first glimmers of realization are appearing in our minds. The enemy's onslaught is intensifying. He from all sides attacks exhausted German troops. There are reports from the aviation barracks, from the railroad embankment, from positions in the southern part of the city. All of them say that the end is galloping closer. In a few hours, the Russian infantry will be already at the entrance to the department store and Paulus, if he is faithful to his own orders to the end, will only have to take up the rifle himself. But he doesn't seem to want to. Late in the evening, Paulus calls a meeting, where the final decision will be made. The commander is said to be planning a last-minute armed sortie, which should bring him death at the head of his officers. Field Marshal, an example for his subordinates, with a grenade in his hand on the cover of an illustrated magazine and the caption under the photo. He fell for the Führer, the people and the Reich. Oh yes, this is what the headquarters wants. This is what is needed to crown the song of the new Nibelungs with a worthy ending. And the commander of the army ponders whether he too should go to the end of the road strewn with grave crosses and corpses of hundreds of thousands of those who died under the high order at the walls of the city and in the city itself. While in the farthest corner of the cellar they are arguing about the best way to stage the last scene of this greatest German tragedy, 
while outside the Red Army is capturing block after block in close combat. Sporadic shots are heard under the vaults of the dungeon. It is the officers' and soldiers' nerves failing. They cannot imagine what will happen to them. They do not want to take a step into this unknown. They are afraid, and people who yesterday, figuratively speaking, walked barefoot through the underworld, choose the shortest way out of this hopeless horror. A but sometimes there is not enough ammunition even for that. That's why they start to gather in groups, acting in concert. In one of the darker cellars, the sapper platoon of the 191st Infantry Regiment gathered, joined by a military judge and a divisional veterinarian. The remaining ammunition is brought down to one place. The men sit down on mines and charges, rummaging through their wallets one last time, pulling out photographs with trembling hands. They look at the faces of their wives and the wide-open eyes of their children. The platoon commander has no time for that. He adjusts the Bickford cord, checks it. It's all right. Attaches the cord to the inductive blasting machine, wins the spring with a four-cornered wrench. He looks around at everyone. Done. Hmm. He says. A second, and outside the retreating infantrymen rush to the ground near the huge crater. The railroad guns rumbled. They say to each other. An unprecedented calibre, thank God we weren't blown apart. And the next wave of retreating men already using the crater as a favourable shelter. The deaths of some push back the deaths of others, and the battle continues, rolling closer and closer to the department store, to the German field marshal. Meanwhile, Paulus decides to surrender as a prisoner. At the last moment, he crosses out Hitler's calculations with a bold line, although he knows that at the moment he needs the dead field marshal, who found his death together with his soldiers. But Paulus no longer wants to enter the textbooks of German history with a marshal's baton in his right hand and with orders on the proudly protruding chest. He does not want that in the Berlin Sport Palast, revenge for Stalingrad, avenge the fallen field march. No, he wants to share the fate of his still surviving soldiers. That's how he now understands the duty of an army commander. The ring is tightening tighter and tighter. The Russians seize one divisional infirmary after another. A continuous stream of wounded flows to Red Square, and especially to the house on which hangs a flag with a red cross. On each bed, two and three, but the flow does not diminish, and everyone needs help. The dead are carried out the door, and when the orderlies return with empty stretchers, there are already two seriously wounded where one had been placed. The moans and screams grow louder by the hour. This is the limit of human suffering. The world history has never known such a thing. The night sky rises over these cans, over the Germanic cans by the great Russian river, and the descendant of Emilius Paulus sits on his camp bunk. He thinks of the soldierly virtues of loyalty and obedience. And what a heavy cross they have laid on the rest of his life. Around 9 p.m., the first Russian tanks burst into Red Square. Twelve officers of the 194th Regiment line up at the exit from the cellar. This is the field marshal's personal guard. Major General Rosk gives the password. The only thing missing, perhaps, trumpeters to play the national anthem so that the scene looked quite Russian. Downstairs in the basement, Paulus gives the last radiogram to his supreme commander in chief. Russian tanks in front of the entrance. This is the end of the Sixth Army. The Sixth Army has faithfully fulfilled its oath. Fought to the last man and the last cartridge, Paulus Field Marshal General. At two o'clock in the morning, Hitler's farewell order is accepted. He praises the actions of the army. It will go down in history. But the end of the radiogram is completely unclear. Georges, and despite everything, saved us the Sixth Army, your Hitler. The order is registered. The radios go silent. Now the word belongs to the Red Army. Around 3 a.m. at the entrance to the department store, the first Russians, their captains, they are sent back, asking for officers of higher rank. After a while, a lieutenant colonel appears. He is escorted to Ruska. The talks are brief. They end with a wish that the Russian general arrives. That Paulus himself is in the basement is not mentioned. Meanwhile, twelve officers are still standing upstairs, not allowing anyone inside the cellar. Two meters away from them, Red Army soldiers are patrolling. No one behaves like in battle anymore. No one thinks of shooting, jumping up, running, looking for shelter. Soviet soldiers feel on the red square of Stalingrad as on the main square of their hometown, somewhere in the rear, in vast Russia, in Siberia, in Turkmenistan, where they came on vacation. Among them there were many officers in good uniforms, fur coats, cotton pants, felt boots. Faces scorched by the fire of battles. 
They are smoking, talking to each other, and next to the German soldiers. One can feel some kind of discharge. The night passes quietly, sometimes very rarely, a shot will ring out somewhere. It is difficult to determine what kind of shot it is. is. Whether in some godforsaken corner, where they still do not know about what is happening. The resistance has resumed, whether it is the notorious last cartridge, or whether it is suicide. Between 6 and 7 a.m., a Russian Major General arrives. The German Major escorts him to the commander of the southern mouth of the cauldron. That, together with the officers of his staff, is seated at a round table. And aside, on the edge of the bunk, resting his elbows on his knees, lowering his head, sits another man, Lieutenant General Schmidt. As soon as the negotiations begin, the Russians are immediately informed. The army commander is also in the basement of the department store. Therefore, the German command agrees to capitulate only on one condition. Russian soldiers will enter the cellar only after Paulus leaves it. The Russian general immediately gives his consent, since on behalf of the German command negotiates one Rosk, the Russians pay attention to the inexplicable presence of the chief of staff of the army. When asked what he is doing here, Schmidt replies that he is present only as an observer from the army commander. He has nothing more to say. His role is over. This man, whose ruthless orders drove tens of thousands of soldiers to their death, is now unrecognizable. Restrained, obedient, submissive, one might even say fearful, he now waits for the end, known for his cruelty, threats, terror. He has now turned into a man standing on the sidelines, a beggar waiting for favor, a handout which will be thrown to him by the magnanimity of the enemy. The Russian general is accompanied by two lieutenant colonels. The younger one, the commander of a tank regiment, says that he took part in the breakthrough of the front of the Italian army at Milirovo. They advanced 50 kilometers on the first day. There is a turn in the war. Germany begins to roll under the mountain. This is the impression of the German officers listening to his words. The second lieutenant colonel is an interpreter. The conversation is conducted politely. Not a single angry word, not a single rude word which the German officers feared. No threats. Everything happens as it should, clearly, correctly. Polite expressions are exchanged. The Russians are treated to the last cigarettes intended for receptions. The winners smile, take out of their pockets whole packs of the best German cigarettes and put them on the table. These cigarettes were kindly dropped to them by German transport planes. In addition, they treat them to oranges. Ruska responds with glucose. They make a quick deal. German officers and soldiers can keep their belongings with them. They are guaranteed their lives and return home after the war. Toward the end, Ruski dictates the last order. The Russian officers nod their heads. In the room where the radio is located, there is excitement. The head of the operations department runs in. He orders, destroy everything. The order is immediately carried out. Axes and hammers smash the transmitter, receiver, cipher machines, burn the dock, everything turns into tabula rasa. When the communications chief of the 62nd Russian army enters the room, all he finds is wreckage. Pale as chalk, he silently slams the door shut. Two minutes later, a German-speaking Russian officer appears. He has only one question. When is all this destroyed? The head of the radio Oberlieutenant tries to answer something, stutters, mumbles. Everything is clear. The indignation of the Russians is understandable, because during the negotiations it was clearly agreed to surrender everything as it is. At about 10 a.m., a limousine arrives at the department store. German soldiers take heavy suitcases out of the basement and put them in the trunk. A tall man approaches the open door from the cellar. He walks, slightly leaning forward. His face is yellow and sluggish. The visor of his cap is pulled low over his eyes. This is Paulus. He casts oblique glances at those standing on the sides, at the still smoking ruins, then sits down in the car. Next to his field marshal, chief of staff, chief of operations and chief of officers department, better stated, drooping and indifferent. They rush past the dead of the last hours, through mountains of corpses and ruins into captivity, under the protection of Russian bayonets from the beginning to realize the truth of the soldiers who were betrayed. At Roski's headquarters silence now ensues. Issuing the 48 remaining sausages to the wounded is the last act of service of this commander. After the strain of the last night and day, the former commander of the Southern Cauldron lies down and falls asleep. When the time comes, he will be awakened. He is the rearguard of the army that came out to win and move to the east, and is now marching there, 
but only much farther than he wanted to go, to the barracks behind barbed wire. Somewhere in the basements of the department store, the last belongings are being gathered. Officers and soldiers bent over satchels. A few shirts and towels, a watch, a pocket knife, a knitted vest, a pot and spoon and socks. That's all. Boxes and suitcases full of uniforms, underwear, boots, were left behind in the convoy, in the nursery and gum rack, fell into the hands of the Red Army, and with the loss of them long ago had to be reconciled. Now it is important to have at least the essentials for the first time of captivity. But much is lacking. The young artillery captain has a rolled-up blanket on his right shoulder. He has nothing else. His helmet and pistol left in the cellar. He now walks slowly under the vaulted ceiling toward the exit. Down the long corridor he makes his way between the grey. Shadow-like men who want, if only for a moment longer, to delay the moment of their final surrender. It is hard for him to walk. Hunger and fatigue do not press with such force as the uncertainty of the future, as the thought that you have to go a long, long... But the worst of it all is the consciousness from which there is no escape. The consciousness that one man abused the faith and trust of his best soldiers until the enemy seized the last corner of the last cellar of this vast city. The feeling that the soldiers had been betrayed was now a realized fact. In the brain and in the heart, which had only just been agonizingly devastated, there is now growing opposition. Yes, many Germans will have their eyes opened now. Harsh reality will take care of that. The march to the east is blocked. It has ended in mass death, mass death of German soldiers. The flickering flame of the smokes illuminates the space of only a few meters. Tired feet tread slowly. Over boards, knapsacks, pistols, crates, radios and glass shards trampled on the floor through dirty thawed snow. Officers and soldiers stride toward the exit over charters. Hitler speeches and Goebbels articles from the regimental library lying underfoot. The crates under it have long since been burned for fuel, and the literature has crumbled. It is trampled with dirty, soaked boots. Closer to the exit, it gets brighter. Up there, the barrier bifurcates, leaving a narrow corridor through which people in tattered grey-green overcoats come out into the light of day, like ghosts of a long-gone time. The ascent leading out of the cellar is so trampled over the hours, so slippery, that it is impossible to get out without help. Arms are stretched out toward the artillery captain. Two Red Army soldiers standing on his right and left help him good-naturedly to climb up towards the clear day. The daylight cuts his eyes, accustomed to the semi-darkness of the cellar. He can hardly distinguish the groups of Russian officers and red-cheeked soldiers standing around and talking among themselves. A few steps away from him, German officers and soldiers from the southern cauldron are forming a front to the east to begin their march into captivity. The captain stands beside them. The fighting is ending in the northern cauldron as well. German troops are squeezed into a small space. Practically it is only the tractor plant with its workshops and remnants of buildings with sheet rolling shop and foundry. Here is defended by Colonel General Strecker. As in the southern section, lack of ammunition, hunger, frost and lice undermine the strength of the last German resistance. The commanders of the units have rejected the Corps P command's order to conduct attacks on January 31 and February 1 to level the front line. They are no longer able to make any progress with bleeding units. The official meeting cannot change anything either. The Corps commander admits the impossibility of offensive action, but insists on further defence and especially forbids any awol actions. February 2 at dawn on the front line is already rumbling anti-tank guns and mortars. The sun rises and an observer from the roof of the workshop firmly establishes that on the left, in front of the positions of the 26th Motorized Infantry Regiment, without a single shot, Russian columns are building up. Units of Russian infantry, in almost close combat formation, are advancing into a gully running at an angle to the front line about 200 meters from the German positions. Other Russian companies accumulate and form up on the heights west of Spartakovka. The bulk of the Russian tanks, anti-tank guns and artillery are at this point still standing quite peacefully, but pointing threateningly toward the cauldron. There is no movement on the German side. The mortars and artillery still fired their last ammunition yesterday. The positions of the 11th Corps are defenseless against the Russian regiments. In order not to put the last soldiers under fire from the Russian guns, the commanders themselves, without orders from above, throw away the white flags, surrendering one by one. By noon, the last group throws down their weapons. The generals had surrendered shortly before. The curtain falls. 
while endless columns of prisoners are dragging their last strength across the snow-covered steppe, while tens of thousands of wounded, unable to move, wait for rescue in the cold pits of cellars, while more than 100,000 dead soldiers lie in the ruins unburied stiff, covered with snow, and a rifle with an empty magazine lying nearby, the motherland is anxiously, with a sinking heart, listening to the loudspeakers. It is full of fear for fathers, husbands and sons. On February 3, all flags in Germany are lowered. The announcer reads the message of the Wehrmacht High Command. The battle at Stalingrad is over. True to its oath to the last breath, the Sixth Army, under the exemplary command of General Field Marshal Paulus, fell in the face of superior enemy forces and unfavorable circumstances. Under the swastika flag, mounted on the highest ruin of Stalingrad, the last battle was fought. Generals, officers, non-commissioned officers and privates fought shoulder to shoulder to the last cartridge. They died so that Germany might live. Their example will be preserved for eternity. This is the message of the Wehrmacht High Command. The whole German people are listening to it. Many believe it, because the leadership of the German Empire knows how to pass off military disasters as successes and put a band-aid of heroism on bleeding wounds because no one in Germany knows what tragedy really played out east of the Don Steps. Yes, from the ruins and surviving facades of the houses, from the empty eye sockets of the windows flags hung down to the ground. Black streaks of smoke and cinders, flames soared into the sky. But where the last shot was fired, the last bullet, where the volleys of Russian rocket mortars crushed the last resistance, there was no waving flag with swastika, there was no Sieg Heil and whoever claims there was is lying. The chapter called Stalingrad is over. Behind is the destroyed, bombed, burned city. Behind graves, a hundred defeated German regiments, 22 divisions. Behind death in the snow, only we survived. Although in Berlin we are considered dead, although there they wish the whole Sixth Army to lie in one grave for all. Generals, officers, non-commissioned officers, privacy, every last man, but we are living. And all the high-sounding words about frontline comradeship, the morning creep and lowered flags do not change anything. Mind remain kilometer after kilometer. Step by step we move forward. Every few meters we stop for a break. There is no more strength, and the will is lost in Stalingrad. It is buried by volleys of rocket mortars under the ruins of a huge city on the Volga, under the ice stained with blood, the lid of the snow coffin, torn to shreds together with those killed by shells. Hours pass. But the tired line of surviving soldiers still stretches its way, uphill and downhill, stopping and moving on again. The sun is slipping towards the west. The huge battlefield has already disappeared behind the horizon. And we still meet again on our way a lot of Russian guns, mortar after mortar, tank after tank. We see reserve regiments and divisions. They stand and have stood here for weeks now to close any breakthrough. We were surrounded by a ring 30-40 kilometers thick, our battle group alone was opposed by 120 rocket mortars, and we didn't have a single gun, but we had infirmaries, dressing stations, cemeteries and grave diggers. It darkens my eyes when I think that the enemy was able to strike an even more powerful blow. Now we see it for ourselves, and we realize the war is lost. Where the Volga makes its last bend to the east lies the town of Krasnoamesk. On its hilly western edge are barracks surrounded by dense rows of barbed wire, Six watchtowers with machine guns and powerful searchlights, it is not allowed to come close to the fence. In the first days of February 1943, the barracks are overcrowded. The surviving soldiers and officers of the Sixth Army are stuffed here like herrings in a barrel, but they are indifferent to the cramped conditions. The last months have made them indifferent to everything. But the cold wave is hard to bear. At 45 degrees below zero, the prisoners think, drowning is better than freezing, so they move a couple of centimetres closer to each other, scraps next to scraps, rags next to rags. Thousands of lice crawling from one to another, from bunk to bunk, infecting the exhausted bodies with rash. Their temperature is also 40 degrees, only not frost, but heat. But none of the prisoners notice it. Next to me on the bunks lies a Colonel Infantryman. What happened to Colonel Prestian? The SMT shot himself. And his adjutant Keller? Shot himself and Eisber, Nertild. Do you know anything about the general in command of the 371st? Yeah, shot himself. Why? Why indeed? After a week, 
it gets a little more spacious. A lot of the men who are lying next to us are resting outside. It's because of rash, dysentery, loss of resistance. For about 70 days we had almost no food, and now people die of hunger with a piece of bread and sausage in their hand. The body doesn't accept anything. Doctors shake their heads and open the next one. The autopsy shows narrowing and antiperistalsis of the intestines and stomach. They cannot fulfill their functions. 90% of all prisoners went to the camp with high fever. Despite the most careful care, many of them can no longer be saved. Russian doctors are fighting for everyone's life. Nurses sit by the bedsides day and night. They do everything they can, sparing no effort, and even their own lives. For many of them become infected and in a few days repeat the path of their patients. One of the prisoners, while opening a tin can, cut his left hand. Three drops of blood came out of the wound. That's enough. The injured man lies down on his bunk. Five minutes later he dies. Hunger psychosis takes hold despite regular meals. We have lost the measure of all things. We fear dying of exhaustion if we don't eat something every half hour. It creates a feeling of unquenchable hunger. It's been two weeks. We don't know exactly. It doesn't interest us. The daily routine is simple. Sleep, nap, eat. And we go to squat in the courtyard in the open air, where telephone wires buzz from the frost and sentries beat their feet. We all have diarrhea. Two of the prisoners have already been driven away by the sentries with shots from the fence they've gotten too close to for privacy from the others. We got bullets in the head often enough, but in the house, it's no use at all. One day, an elegant limousine pulls up outside the barracks. The colonel in a half fur coat and an elderly woman get out of it and head for the camp commandant. The barometer of our atmosphere rises immediately. In a few minutes, the most incredible rumors begin to circulate. Minutes of tense waiting pass, and already the colonel with a woman dressed in black is standing at our bunk. He addresses us with words of friendly gree. Good day, gentlemen. Then he sits down on a rickety stool. While he lights a cigarette, everyone stares at it avidly. Then he hands out a three-quarters full packet. This is no longer a matter of politeness, no respect for rank and file. All ravenously throw themselves on cigarettes. The picture is unattractive. The colonel smiles. He begins to talk. An old woman translates. Gentlemen, I've come to tell you that you're going to Moscow today. We don't need this, Mr. Colonel. It was my neighbor, Colonel Weber, who spoke for the rest of us. We'll freeze to death in the cattle cars at 45 degrees below zero. I'd rather they put us up against the wall. But, gentlemen, you're in the Soviet Union, not in Germany. We treat our prisoners like human beings, who said anything about cattle cars. You will, of course, travel in passenger cars. We haven't noticed any particularly good treatment so far. That may be so. After the kind of battle we've been through, life is slow to return to normal. What did you expect, exactly? That we'd send you to a rest home? Feed you ham and wine? No, gentlemen, you are not our guests. We didn't invite you to our place. We didn't invite you to the Volga. Nevertheless, we'll treat you decently. And after the war, you'll return to your homeland. Well, we'll see about that. But first, we need not passenger cars, but better food and sanitary conditions. We can't offer you anything else. Everything here has been destroyed and devastated by your own hand. There is not enough transportation to provide regular food for 90,000 prisoners. In addition, we fear the outbreak of epidemics as soon as it gets warmer. Therefore, our government wants you to leave the area as soon as possible. We'll start with the generals and senior officers. You'll go through the Laos and then go to the train station. For the first time, we were shown in the mirror our recent past, our own deeds and their consequences. And so the words addressed to us have gradually taken effect. But at the moment, we are unable to experience anything but horror. Half an hour later, we are all sitting on our bunks in our own clothes. Our stuff has been tied up in knots and taken to the extermination chamber. From there, our clothes should return insect-free. There are all sorts of speculations about the real purpose of our... No one believes in passenger cars. Already the command get out is heard and we are still just getting our miserable rags. We hastily pull them on our emaciated bodies, but some articles of clothing are missing. Apparently, the prisoners of war, who were manning the bathhouse and the washerwoman, left something for themselves as a souvenir. So it turns out that the colonel goes out in socks and the major in his underwear. A, all the same, the station is only two kilometers away. We move at the pace of the funeral procession. Legs do not obey. 
Now we ourselves notice that we just jumped off the gravedigger's shovel. That's why it took us an hour to get to the tracks where our train is standing. We are led past the freight cars, past the common cars. Wait, yes indeed, in front of us are bought cars, real bought cars. We can't believe our eyes. The Soviet colonel kept his word. Allocation to the cars is quick. In five minutes we are already sitting in our compartment. The shelves are filled with snow-white linen. We look at each other. No one dares to lie on it in his dirty pants, but the confusion quickly passes. I pull myself up on my hands to the top shelf and want to get comfortable, as I hear a young woman's voice. Good evening, gentlemen. Have you received cigarettes today? From surprise I turn sharply and almost fall down. At the bottom stands smiling, shining, clean girl in a white apron and with a tray in her hand. On the tray are packs of cigarettes. When prisoners are asked if they have received anything, of course they say no. But this time they did. They didn't give us cigarettes in Krasnolomaisk, and now everyone gets a whole pack, and even matches. Overcoats and hats hang on a hook. I lie on the top shelf and inhale a spicy cigarette. After many weeks without smoking, my eyes are swimming in circles. The lamp, the shelves, the window become blurred, and I can no longer tell who I am and where I am, whether it is true or a dream. Or maybe all this is already in the other world, and I have long since decayed in a mass grave. Or did my mind go blank at the last moment? Is it possible that after this meat grinder I am in a passenger carriage going through Stalingrad in a compartment with snow-white linen, with a cigarette in my hand, carelessly unbuttoning an old uniform? and a Russian girl is talking to me in a friendly manner? No, it's incomprehensible. It's incredible. It can't be true. I bite my tongue to feel the pain and feel that all this is happening in reality, as I see and hear it. No, I'm not dead or insane, but I'm not a peaceful tourist traveling to Moscow on a travel bureau voucher. I'm only a prisoner of war being treated unexpectedly well. That evening my compartment mates and I never cease to be amazed. We are provided with bread and lard, meat, sausage, fish, sugar given spoons and forks. And everyone is even given a bar of toilet soap. We just don't know where to put these riches. You can't deny that our spirits have lifted. Just a few hours ago we were sitting on our wooden bunks, thinking and fantasizing about what would happen to us, and waiting for another slice of bread. No wonder our barometer didn't point to change over then. No one could tell us what the future would bring. True, even now no one can tell us that. But the feeling of constraint, the feeling that in any situation you are looked at only as an enemy, as a shot predator, from which even in the cage you cannot take your eyes off. Gone was the feeling of fear that we would have to answer for all the Nazi atrocities, for things we only knew about by hearsay, the feeling of guilt that we never did anything against it. Now all of that has somehow receded into the background. A man breathes again, and the cramped compartment fills with optimism. In shirt and pants we lie on our shelves, under white blankets and smoke. Sometimes we look out of the window when we pass a station or pass a military train with tanks and other equipment, which rumbles past us to the front. Our conversation, and understandably so, revolves around the same theme. The uncertainty of our future. After the vivid lesson the Soviets have taught us, it is no longer the outcome of the war that concerns us first and foremost. The defeat of Germany is almost universally regarded as an inevitable fact. Now we are concerned with our own fate. There's plenty of room for imagination. The best thing would be an exchange of prisoner officers through Sweden or even Japan. We argue until the first snore reminds us of the need to sleep. In the morning we wash, shave, have breakfast. Then the doctor comes in. He listens to the complaints of each of us. After all, we have all received something to remember Stalingrad pains and superficial wounds, fever and broken bones. With great patience we begin to be treated with powders, ointments, pills, and in parting with a kind word. Major Paul is still bandaging his leg wound when a short Russian lieutenant colonel enters the compartment. He takes a seat on the bottom shelf. In his hands he holds a large map and many newspapers. He informs us about the situation on the fronts. We hear the names of cities and towns where we spent the last winter, and which three months ago were considered a deep rear area. Somehow it grabs the heart when we think of the many, many kilometers we had to walk to get here, when we think of the countless German soldiers' cemeteries left along the way, to the left and to the right of the road on which we marched forward. Now the war is rolling back towards Germany, and we ourselves are rolling towards Moscow. The conversation doesn't go well. 
It revives only when the conversation turns to the weapons with which the Russians are now advancing. As people tactically and technically educated, we are united in our appreciation of Russian mortars and multi-barrel rocket launchers. Schultz, the lowly infantry major from the top shelf, now sitting downstairs next to me, is fuming about the failings of our command. Why didn't we copy the Russians' multi-barrel rocket launchers? We've experienced what kind of casualties they cause. Shouldn't we learn from the enemy in the course of a war? I think it would have taken us much farther. Where exactly it would take us, he doesn't say. Maybe he's thinking of the Urals or even Moscow and Baku, but we're not interested in that, it's all completely behind us. Only Poole, a full major with a shot leg, still can't let go of that thought. That's right, Schultz. If those upstairs had reacted faster, we probably wouldn't have been sorted down like that on the Volga. I mean, not so much the six-barrel mortars. Well, them too. Of course, too. But tanks, that's more important. The T-34 is what we should have had. It goes everywhere. We should have copied it, just it alone, and that would have been enough. Whoever has the T-34 will win the war. The Soviet lieutenant colonel, smiling, agrees with Poole. Yes, of course, you are right, our tanks are good. But that is not the main thing. Where and at what pace they moved determine the people sitting in them, and our men know what they want. That's what you've all seen, or maybe you still haven't. But what happened to you is just the beginning, and you can calculate where it ends. Regular meals, medical care, and the Russian lieutenant colonel's information about the situation at the front, which we look forward to every time, and last but not least, plenty of sleep become a normal daily routine to which we quickly get used to. To me, it would be nice if the train would run like this between Stalingrad and Vladivostok until the first bell rings, heralding peace. But here I find myself at odds with the other companions. Sufficient food turns the war-weary and life-weary offices into a group of people who, although glad to have got out of the mass grave on the Volga, and can breathe a sigh of relief, but each of whom again begins to show his own understanding of things, character, upbringing, and temperament, and so sharply that the first cracks in the monolith of our common destiny are already becoming visible. Some people consider every truck they see as American, provided by Lend-Lease, and praise it as a technical miracle, while others bow before the Red Star. If Major Poole finds no words to express his gratitude for the treatment of his gunshot wound, his vis-a-vis -vis considers every visit, by the train doctor a cleaver propaganda stunt. For most of the passengers on our train, it is now clear that in the past year the Wehrmacht has overreached, that the goals set in comparison with our forces were, we say, excessive. But there are those who still consider the Urals an attainable goal. While I jokingly express my wish to stay longer in our train, two officers are already working out the first plan of escape. In any case, we, several majors in one compartment, after four days have already diverged so far from each other, that we soberly state that it is impossible to bring our views to a common denominator. However, we will have to talk about this topic many times. We have enough time. The long ribbon of railroad tracks holds us for many more days. To the monotonous clatter of the wheels, it is best to lie stretched out on the shelf and watch the puffs of cigarette smoke. The experience passes in front of me, quickly and vaguely. The former years, slowly and with sharp contours, the last month's encirclement resistance, the last cartridge and the last blow from which I could not defend myself. Yes, it is almost a miracle that I managed to escape alive from the cauldron of death. But it is also amazing that we all resisted so long and so unitedly. It's doubly amazing when I look at my compartment mates. No, I have nothing against them personally, against their thoughts, against known variance in perception and understanding of things. Everyone has his own head on his shoulders but we have so little in common in our goals and desires that one can't help but begin to doubt whether this much lauded frontline comradeship exists at all. You begin to think deeper and remember the mercenary soldiers of Frunsberg and Wallenstein, and then you ask yourself a question. What, in fact, binds the officer and the soldier who gives the order? Is it only the oath taken jointly? No, because they swore allegiance to one single person, Hitler, and not to the people. This alone demanded the expression of their own point of view, and led to the emergence of different opinions and even opposition, because everyone put a different meaning into the oath. But then came the successes in Poland, in the north and west of Europe. Many hundreds of kilometers were left behind, the officers had traveled together with the soldiers, and looking at each other they knew that each of them at the same time was drenched in sweat, trembling and cursing when they made a rush, 
inspired sought shelter. It brought them closer together. Someone said the word comradeship. It was taken up by a chorus of voices, and soon it was heard from all the loudspeakers, printed in bold type in all the newspapers, but everyone understood it differently because there was no common purpose. If you look through the Book of German History, such a common goal can be found as an exception only in those battles in which the struggle was for the freedom of entire peoples. That is why the names of Arminius, Prince Eugene of Savoy and Blücher have not faded down to our days. A whole bunch of writers had a hand in twisting concepts after the First World War. And they succeeded. There's no denying it. The drop wears away the stone. That's why we perceive the war as a baptism of steel, according to Jungder's template and frontline camaraderie, according to Dwinger's template. All our experiences were normalized, and we ourselves were not conscious of it. More than that, we forcibly squeezed the stubborn reality into the school form of our perceptions. We gave our soldiers a fake coin and told them it was gold. But we ourselves believed what we said, and we were generally regarded as honest brokers. And yet I should long ago have wondered about the meaning of this much vaunted frontline comradeship. I was reminded of my first commander of the war years. I served under him in 1939. He was a man of strict rules. In a morally scanty atmosphere, he tried to preserve his moral character and firmly held in his hands the reins of education of officers. Here are ten vices of which he reminded us day after day, striving to exterminate them at any cost. Drunkenness, gluttony, smoking, negligence, love of full women, self-enrichment, self-aggrandizement, defecation of E.K. dreaming of vacations and driving on the lift. We laughed at it at the time, thought his rebukes were exaggerated, and the whole thing was a crank. But it was more than a fad. On the one hand, there was a grain of truth in his words, and on the other hand, they could at least serve as a reason to talk about comradeship. After all, soldiers and officers of all ranks reduced the concept of comradeship to a dozen beers, an organized suckling pig, and a pack of cigarettes shared by all. They called themselves camarades, but in reality they were at best team players, always ready to elbow their way in when it came to their personal gain, their careers, or the second half of the Ten Commandments. But the faithful old camaraderie was poetized by the court Odi writers and war correspondents, for which they had enough of such expressions as Paul. You shoot and I'll jump. The chorus of Hura, in honor of the supreme commander of the Wehrmacht and the field bivouac on the rocks. To top it all off with a couple of sentimental soldier songs. Enough to write frontline reports and thick novels and to influence the tear glands of the people on the home front. After all, people became less discriminating and perceived the fictions they were presented with as a hymn to frontline comradeship. That was just what was required. Whole contingents of two decades died on the battlefields, and everything was portrayed as it never happened and could not be in reality. A false idea of strength was inculcated, the people were supposed to believe it and fight harder. Thus the average German spent his whole life faithfully and bravely contented himself with the illusion of comradeship, first as a child, then at school, and then at the front. And it ended with the song I had a comrade, so God is with us, for the king and the fatherland, God is with us. For the Führer, the people and the Reich. The lauded comradeship became a frame for the heroic death that swallowed up in the bloom of years more than one generation of German youth. This front comradeship became, so to speak, the golden trim of millions of postcards with death notices. And no one wanted to see that the sum of the small external signs of comradeship far from creating a real comradeship. It probably required a new outlook for such a true comradeship to be born on the basis of common interests and a high purpose. Lighting a new cigarette, I glance down. Three of my companions are sitting there. They are clearly busy now with point seven of my old commander's commandments, self-glorification. A lowly infantry major is ranting. The spike in my battalion was first rate. In the penultimate week, we were then in the Voroponovo area, Two soldiers came to me and asked me to send them to the divisional rear. Well, you understand, to organize something. Of course I don't mind. In the evening, both of them came back with their hands full. They brought bread and cigarettes. I don't care where they got them from. But that's the main thing that's why I'm telling this story. One of them reaches into his pocket and puts two packs of Uno cigarettes on the table. Just the ones I smoke, and I haven't had them for a long time. Can you imagine in our position at the time? 
Gentlemen, I must admit I was truly touched. Isn't this the kind of camaraderie you read about in books? You won't find it anywhere else. It's been a week since we left. The train is still going through white steppes, through snow-covered forests. Telegraph poles flicker. Towns and villages are left behind. The train stops only occasionally. Our compartment became calmer. Conversations in the neutral zone between the collapsed front of the recent past and the barbed wire of the near future became silent. We stopped just stringing together days and events. It's time to reflect on your own place in this battle, to realize what you did right or wrong and what justified it. It's time to sort out your own thoughts. There are many questions that require a clear and definitive answer from me, but one of them is particularly disturbing and does not give me peace. How could it happen that I fought to the end, that I stood to the last, although I had long ago realized the meaninglessness of our understanding of duty? For the first time this question arose before me, when in early January was broken 79th Infantry Division and its number was erased from the general staff maps. After all, not only a symbolic one has grown on the territory of the factory, an invisible cross over the grave of the division. No, next to it stood a smaller cross, but a real one over the grave of my soldiers who died there, and apart from my own will. What I'd vaguely begun to realize in those first days of the new year, now turned in me into an irrefutable certainty. No, I could not absolve myself of the guilt for having led a whole battalion to ruin, in spite of all doubts, in spite of my reasoning. In the end I always only answered Yavol, when it was necessary to carry out far from real orders and throw my companies into bloody battles. Of course, I myself went with the soldiers when the going got tough, I risked my life as well as others, but I set an example for them, and it was fatal for seven hundred of them. Where I am there is victory, where I am there is a banner around which you must rally, and they followed me, everyone in Stalingrad followed some, Paulus. For OK generals, for his army commander, I am for my division commander and the soldiers, but they followed me from position to position, from shop to shop, until from a strong battalion was not left a pitiful handful. They were driven to fight, they were driven to die, and I too am guilty of that, as was my division commander, maybe not to such an extent, but the seven hundred dead and maimed look at me as soon as I close my eyes. They us and you. We all looked up to you, you ordered us where to go, you were with us, and you cannot hide from us for nothing, as if what do I say to them, to them, and to myself? All I can say weighs little compared to the seven hundred dead and maimed, it is. Yes, from the very beginning I stood for the breakthrough, tried to convince the general, but this does not absolve me of guilt. It's all just words. I had to act. But how? The engineer battalion was the least suitable, forever attached to other units. For days and weeks subordinated to other commanders, divided into groups and teams. It practically found itself concentrated in my hands, only when we attacked in its entirety or occupied the defense, as it was on the territory of the factory. But the thought of rebelling against the order did not occur to me then. But it could not have occurred to me at that time, for despite some doubts, I had been chasing victory only three months before, and then it was too late for our battalion. After Christmas, only infantry could have stopped a battle that had become hopeless, but it didn't. Its commanders persisted in their obedience, as if there were nothing more natural in the world than to make whole regiments bleed to death without even asking the meaning of the sacrifice. Deprived of a sense of responsibility, the officers have become the instruments of a blind force of self-destruction. But would I have acted differently as an infantry commander? Probably not either. I would have been just like them, without knowing a moment's rest, following orders, giving orders, mending breaches, reinforcing positions, making phone calls, ordering mines and wire fences to be set up, and defending the basement. My brain would be drilling the same thought all the time. What will those over there do to us when we fire our last round? And all the time I would answer myself the same thing. You have nothing to ask. Look at that factory, then you will understand what awaits us. And if someone started to tell me otherwise, I'd say to him, I want to live too, so go away and leave me alone. That's exactly what it would be, don't kid yourself. From afar everything looks different, even from the flower pot. There I sat there rattling my fist in my pocket, waiting in vain but nothing ever happened. And then to dull my conscience, I decided to be with the soldiers to the end. I wanted to share their fate with them, whatever it turned out to be, even if it was death still nothing else we were waiting for, and it would be the best way out. 
to die at the walls of a huge city where others already lay. But even that was not given to me. My general burned the whole division in the fire and thus fulfilled his task. Disbandment of the defeated division was the logical consequence, and the end of the battle I had to endure together with shrapnel groups of foreign parts. But when at the end of January I took up positions at Tsaritsa, I still had the opportunity in the penultimate hours to act as I thought an infantry commander should have done. I could honourably surrender and at least on this piece of land stop the bloodshed. I must honestly say that if my old battalion was still alive, no oath, no orders would have stopped me from marching in full marching formation to the prisoners. But the fighting group to which I belonged was incredibly diverse, not only in the numbers of units from which it was hastily formed, but also in its attitude toward Hitler and the Battle of the Cauldron. There were quite a few fanatical Nazis here who had to beware. Hundreds of honest soldiers who had arbitrarily ended the war for themselves were already lying in the snow, shot for cowardice at the verdict of a court-martial. I did not want to be among them. My death would do no one any good. In spite of all the measures of the German command, the hand of the clock was already close to twelve, and the decomposition of the troops was increasing. Two or three more days, and the curtain would fall. Therefore, one way or another, it was too late to give an impetus to a complete cessation of hostilities by partial surrender. The only thing left for me to do was to take care of the soldiers, to protect them from senseless orders, and to keep them safe from the field gendarmerie. In doing so, my adjutants and I turned a blind eye when individual soldiers stopped resisting and crossed the front line on their own. This is what I remember now, on the train. That's what I'm summarising. But putting my hand on my heart, I cannot say that it is balanced. Let there be a thousand reasons and excuses, but one thing is clear. My guilt towards my soldiers is in and that guilt weighs on me. I myself, if I may say so, parachuted out of the burning airplane and the rest of the crew perished. Whether I will find solid ground beneath my feet remains to be seen. But when I leave this country, leaving my battalion lying in its soil forever, I will not be silent any longer. I will tell the sons of my soldiers what their fathers died for. To open the eyes of youth, to prevent a repetition, to warn against the Third Punic War, that must be my task. And only if I succeed will I feel a little better in my own skin. But that is a long way off, for I am still a prisoner of war, who is supposed to be silent while the canon speaks.